That's news! Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Well, Australia's own shotgun. Shannon O'Connell posted this via her Instagram account with a caption that reads, I'm coming. And in the images displayed here, you'll see that Shannon O'Connell is in a pole position to challenge not just for the IBF title, but the WBA title as well. It seems that in the year of 2022, Shannon should be fighting for a world title of some kind, whether it's the WBA title or the IBF title. Late last year, Shannon signed the No Limit Promotions. No Limit Promotions that also promotes Tim Zhu. Pretty big name down there in the land down under. Thus, it's conceivable that a world title fight may just land on the shores of Australia for Shannon O'Connell should one of the reigning champions by way of the WBA, by way of the IBF, be so ordered to fight her. It's either fight or flight. They either fight her or vacate those alphabet titles. Jamie Mitchell, the reigning WBA champion. She hasn't had the chance to defend that title just yet. I heard a rumor that Jamie's next fight isn't going to be Shannon Courtney, the former WBA champion. I heard a rumor that Jamie's next fight is going to be somebody else, but Shannon's next fight is supposed to be Jamie. And the way that breaks down, Jamie's got to make it through her next fight in order for Shannon's next fight to beat Jamie. And whoever wins that fight, they're going to have to deal with Shannon O'Connell. Shannon, who's a lot more experienced than either Shannon Courtney or Jamie Mitchell. You wonder that Jamie's next fight isn't Shannon O'Connell. If that rumor checks out that Jamie Mitchell's not going to be boxing Shannon Courtney in her next fight, she's going to be boxing someone else. What if that someone else is Shannon O'Connell? You know, I have expected Shannon to get her title shot last year, and she had a very productive 2021, but she didn't get to box for a full-fledged world title last year. So what if this rumor about Jamie fighting someone else is... What if that someone else is Shannon O'Connell? If it is, that could presumably turn out to be part of a matchroom show. Shannon might have to travel. You could give Shannon good odds against Jamie. And it's not because Jamie isn't a good fighter. She's a good fighter. She's proven that much. It's just that Shannon is a lot more experienced than Jamie. Hell, if Jamie wouldn't have won that fight with Shannon Courtney, I would have given Shannon O'Connell good odds to beat Shannon Courtney as well. She's a lot more experienced than they are and very aggressive. She'll fuck you up. Sexy. She'll fuck you up. She's hungry and she's coming. She'll fuck you up. Jamie Mitchell at this time is an unbeaten fighter and unbeaten champion. And it just so happens that shotgun Shannon O'Connell in her last six fights, she's given four unbeaten fighters their first professional losses. That's right. Four unbeaten fighters. Bianca Elmire, Kylie Fulmer, Shernika Johnson, more recently Taylor Robertson towards the end of last year. Four unbeaten fighters. I'm telling you, it's not that Jamie's not a good fighter. She's a good fighter, but she's about as experienced as Shannon Courtney. As a professional, she is. And that's the best girl she's fought so far, Shannon Courtney. That being said, neither one of them are as experienced as Shannon O'Connell, who's 38 years old, but she hasn't missed a beat. She'll fuck you up. That's just something to think about by way of the WBA. That may be the reason we keep hearing Jamie's going to fight someone else is because that someone else is Shannon O'Connell. And even if it isn't, even if Jamie ends up boxing someone other than Shannon and Shannon altogether, she might still have to deal with her afterwards. Somebody's going to have to. The potential winner of Mitchell versus Courtney 2 or Maria Cecilia Roman by way of Argentina, the reigning IBF bantamweight champion. Shannon's in a pole position to fight her as well. And like the aforementioned fights with the aforementioned fighters, I would give shotgun Shannon O'Connell good odds to beat Maria Cecilia Roman, who was in action not that long ago. I think Shannon could beat her too. It's a strange twist of fate. That Shernika Johnson, Johnson, who was beaten by Shannon O'Connell not that long ago, is already tabbed to participate in a world title fight up there at Super Bantamweight. When she fought Shannon, it was at Bantamweight. Better still, it's a strange twist of fate that Shernika knows she's going to be boxing for a world title very soon, in spite of having lost to Shannon O'Connell, who we don't know at this time. Just saying, wouldn't it be weird that Shernika loses to Shannon O'Connell only to fight for a world title? Before Shannon O'Connell. Got a fight date for her and everything, and an opponent. It'd be a great pity if the year of 2022 comes and goes without shotgun Shannon O'Connell boxing for a world title. Let's hope that's not the case. Let's hope that we see her challenge for either the WBA or IBF title. 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 And middleweight news, what is still middleweight news? Apparently, Andre versus Alim Kanuli per spit has been delayed. WBO grants additional week for a deal. A deal. Demetrius deal. Andre and Yanni Bek Alim Kanuli have been granted more time to reach a deal for their WBO ordered middleweight title fight. Boxingscene.com has learned 
that a previously scheduled January 14th purse bid hearing has been delayed by one week, as both camps have requested additional time for their mandatory title fight. The request comes days after the San Juan Puerto Rico headquartered WBO announced that too much time had elapsed and presenting an agreement for Team Andrade's alternate plan of an interim WBO super middleweight title fight with England's Zach Parker. Whichever fight Andre chooses to accept, he now has another week to do so. Andre versus Alim Kanuli was formally ordered on November 30th, shortly after both participants scored knockout wins one day apart. Andre registered the fifth defense of his WBO middleweight title with a second round knockout of Ireland's Jason Quigley in a zone streamed main event last November 19th at SNHU Arena in Manchester, New Hampshire. After the fight, the Providence Brett Southpaw, who was fighting less than an hour from his hometown, called for bigger fights. Singled out were unbeaten former WBO junior middleweight titleist Jaime Munguia and IBF titleist Gennady Golovkin, both of whom also fight on his own. Though neither one wants to fight Demetrius Andre. Golovkin remains locked into a title unification clash with WBA claimant Ryota Murata, awaiting a new date as their planned December 29th clash was cancelled due to COVID-related travel restrictions for visitors entering Japan. Munguia was also the mandatory challenger for Andre's title, but has instead chosen to pursue a shot at the WBC belt. That left the sanctioning body to declare Kazakhstan's Alim Kanuli as its mandatory. The unbeaten Middleweight did his part to keep his place in line, stopping former secondary titleist Hassan Endam Jakam. In the eighth round of their preliminary bout on a November 20th ESPN Plus pay-per-view show at Michelob Ultra Arena in Las Vegas, Parker, unbeaten super middleweight Zach Parker, has been waiting on a title shot since the pandemic. Having advanced to the top contender spot following an 11th round stoppage of Rohan Murdoch in March of 2020, the 27-year-old Brit who is managed by Neil Marsh and fights under Frank Warren's Queensbury promotions banner has since fought three times most recently in a fourth round stoppage of marcus morrison last november in birmingham england should the wbo still permit parker to challenge for an interim super middleweight title it will have to come against another opponent andre is currently locked in two other plans barring his vacating the wbo middleweight belt and you have to wonder if demetrius andre were to vacate that wbo middleweight title ahead of this order would that affect his status moving up in weight to super middleweight to potentially challenge a Zach Parker? And I've asked this before. Is Zach Parker even receptive to a Demetrius Andre fight? Zach Parker, who is promoted by Queensbury Promotions, helmed by Frank Warren. Demetrius, as we all know, is a matchroom Eddie Hearn fighter. I can see there being friction there. And I can see there being some unwillingness from the Zach Parker side of things to afford Demetrius Andre an opportunity that technically he already has. He being Zach Parker. Zach Parker at 168 pounds is already in a pole position to challenge for the WBO title at that weight. When it comes to Demetrius, I've asked this before and I'll ask it again. Super champ. Does Demetrius Andre have WBO super champion status that would allow him to move up in weight and become a mandatory challenger for the WBO title? I'm not sure that he has that working for him. It's the situation that it's always been and this news is being interpreted as Demetrius Andre potentially staying in the middleweight division for at least one more fight. What could be the Yanni Bekalim Kanuli fight. Because why else would both teams, Demetrius Andre's included, have requested more time to reach a deal unless a deal were underway. It gives you the sense that maybe he's going to stay there for this fight because Zach Parker ain't got no more of a profile than Yanni Bekalim Kanuli does. My honest opinion, I'm okay with either fight. I know that some people out there have already taken a liking to accusing Demetrius Andre of ducking Yanni Bekalim Kanuli. My honest opinion, I'm okay with either fight. I'm okay with him fighting Yanni Bekalim and I'm okay with him moving up in weight to fight Zach Parker. I'm okay with either choice, either decision. I understand that Yanni Bekalim Kanuli shows a lot of promise, and I've talked about that promise plenty of times here on the channel. He looks like a promising young fighter, could develop into a force in the middleweight division, and I understand that. But I also understand that a Yanni Bekalim Kanuli fight for Demetrius Andre is no bigger a fight than a Zach Parker fight. But the difference being, fighting Zach Parker and getting through that fight may end up affording you the chance to become a three-division champion. Yeah, Yanni Beck's an interesting fighter. Won't lie about that. He shows a lot of promise.
promise. He's got a strong corner. He's confident. He's confident he beats Demetrius Andre, and he's been very vocal about it by way of his social media. So if it happens the other way and Demetrius beats him, well, Demetrius Andre's detractors, who have become quite comfortable lambasting him, trashing him. Will they give him credit for beating Yannibek Alin Kanuli? How proven is he really? He beat Rob Brandt, which is good. Solid fight, solid fighter. He beat Hassan Endam Jakam, though I think we all expected him to do that. If Demetrius Andre, as a reigning champion, turns around and beats him, are Demetrius' detractors going to really give him credit for it? Or will the story quite conveniently change? We see that a lot in the sport of boxing. A lot of guys who picked Caleb Plant for some reason to beat Canelo Alvarez all of a sudden didn't want to give Canelo Alvarez credit for proving them wrong. Could that happen with Demetrius and Yannibek? One thing is clear. A Demetrius Andre versus Yannibek Alim Kanuli fight is a good fight. The problem is only hardcore boxing fans know that. It's not the kind of fight that Demetrius is looking for. Not on the scale he's looking for. I saw Yannibek Alim Kanuli's last fight against Hassan Endom, and he won the fight in the fashion I expected him to win the fight. He won by way of knockout. Though I did notice he looked a bit robotic. He still looked a little bit... He looked predictable. It's safe to say that Demetrius is a lot more experienced than Yannibek Alim Kanuli. They're both southpaws, so neither guy has that advantage over the other. Andre's a statuesque pure boxer that's fluid. Awkward, slightly off balance at times, though still trickier than anyone that Yanni Beck has faced so far. Is Yanni Beck ready for this here and now? I anticipated an order like this happening further down the line than it's actually happening. Thus, I question whether or not Yanni Beck is ready for this now. If they can get it over the line, it's actually a really good fight. Earlier this week here on the channel, we talked about how Tyson Fury has taken a liking to hurling steroid allegations at none other than Oleksandr Yusik. Oleksandr Yusik, who, as a professional, to my knowledge, has never tested positive for a steroid or a banned substance, yet Tyson Fury has taken a liking to accusing him of such what? nonetheless. And to that, Klitschko. Usyk's countryman, former unified heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko, stated Tyson Fury, you live in a glass house and someone needs to take away your stones. Wasn't long ago before our fight where you actually tested positive. Anyone can Google it. Keep it classy. Hashtag Usyk champion. Hashtag Ukraine. Hashtag hypocrite. And it's about time that the professionals, the people in the business, the fighters, the champions... Check him. Check Tyson Fury on what is his sporadic hypocrisy. He's gotten accustomed to shooting off at the mouth without being checked. He must be very satisfied with himself and think himself a media darling that he would go as far as accusing an otherwise innocent fighter of steroid use when there's no evidence of that. But there is evidence of him using banned substances. For at minimum, a banned substance being present in his system during the time of a competition. The Christian Hammer fight. I mean, we've all mulled over it. We've been there and done that. And what I'm highlighting here is that Tyson Fury must be really satisfied with himself, really comfortable to think he can hurl baseless? He thinks he can make baseless accusations about steroid use. But he must if he's making them. Him having tested positive for a steroid himself, he must be very comfortable to think he can get away with this in full view of the public eye without being checked for it himself. His fans always let him contradict himself and don't castigate him for it. For how many years has that been going on? The man who likens himself to a Spartan that doesn't care about money and doesn't care about business, yet the whole holdup with the Dillian Vite fight is money and business. If money don't mean nothing to you, just give the guy a respectable split so you can do the fight, Mr. Spartan. He says he's a Spartan, not a businessman. That's what he said. Those were the words that came out of his mouth, and God forbid bid that his own fans check him for it and hold him to his word. Because they don't, that might be the reason that Tyson Fury has grown comfortable enough to think he can make baseless accusations, steroid allegations about what is an otherwise clean fighter. You think I'm trying to convince you the whole sport of boxing is clean? I'm not. I'm telling you that a guy who tested positive for Nandrolone several years ago is in no position to cast judgment over a guy that hasn't tested positive for Nandrolone or anything else for that matter. That's what I'm telling you, that you shouldn't throw stones if you live in a glass house. Seriously, the fucking nerve of this guy. Very recently, Derek Chisori has stated that he feels Anthony Joshua can still beat Tyson Fury, that he blasted Tyson Fury out of there. And to that, Tyson Fury, who's never at a loss for words, once again took to social media. This is a message for Derek Chisora. I've just seen that you said you think AJ would blast me out. Never in a million years. If the biggest puncher in history couldn't blast me out, and Vladimir Klitschko couldn't blast me out, a big old bodybuilder can't blast me out, my friend. So, Del, 
he ain't got the bottle to fight Usyk again. Usyk will smash him next time properly. Never mind beat him on points and knock him out. But listen, it only takes one man like me. There's only ever been one man on these shows, and he called the Gypsy King, a.k.a. Tyson Fury. It just gets repetitive after a while, like a broken record. He claims that Deontay Wilder is the biggest puncher in history. What the hell is that based on? It's another baseless claim from Tyson Fury. Deontay Wilder doesn't hold any records in the sport of boxing. He really doesn't. Billy Bird has more recorded knockouts than Deontay Wilder. Behind Billy Bird is Archie Moore. 138 knockouts, 132 knockouts. Wilder doesn't hold any records for the most knockouts, any heavyweight records for the most first-round knockouts. Shannon Briggs has more first-round knockouts than Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder don't crack the top ten for most knockouts in the sport of boxing. Not even exclusive to the heavyweight division. Deontay Wilder won't crack the top ten of heavyweight boxers that have amassed the most professional knockouts. So where does Tyson Fury get that he's the biggest puncher in history? It is yet another baseless claim from a guy who's growing quite accustomed to make baseless claims. And the only reason he's doing it is to indirectly glorify himself for having beaten Deontay Wilder. I don't know that we're ever going to get Joshua versus Fury. I just know that this is a baseless claim. Yeah, like saying that Usyk's on steroids. Though, even if he were, if he would have test positive for a steroid tomorrow, that would only make Alexander Usyk no better than you because you popped for one years ago. I really don't know what's next for Tyson Fury. I really don't know what's next for this guy, Dillian Vite, Robert Hellenius. Robert Hellenius, who very recently stated he likes his chances against Tyson Fury. He thinks he'd be easier to beat than Alexander Usyk, and we may get the chance to find out because it's hard to imagine that Tyson Fury and Dillian Vite will ever fight. Tyson Fury talks a good one, but he's behaving just like Deontay Wilder. Maybe the Americans don't realize that $5 million up front at 25% of the split is peanuts for Dillian White. Maybe they don't realize that because they're not Brits. They're not in the UK. They don't know that this is a stadium fight. And they don't realize that Dillian White has his own marquee value. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't care in any event. Making a Fury versus White fight is proving to be just as difficult as making a Wilder versus White fight was. We'll see what happens.